Welcome back to another episode of the We Love to Build podcast. This is 128 with Dan Freckling. We're recording on January 2nd, 2023. So this is the first official recording of the year. And hopefully, if you're listening to this around this time, you've had a nice holiday weekend. Hopefully you have as well. Dan, you were telling me that you went uh, skiing, which I have never done. And I am slightly afraid of because I've, I've heard of people, you know, hitting trees and stuff. So I'd rather not die from that. Had one concussion, that's enough for me. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But uh, let me just say who you are so people know. Uh, you are the CEO of Boltive, which helps brands to protect their end users from malicious, offensive, and surveillance media. It's kind of a mouthful. Hopefully you can explain that in a little bit more depth. Uh, so why don't you tell everyone more about that, uh, a little bit more about yourself. Uh, you want to share about the skiing, go for it and we can go from there. Well, I actually discovered something you haven't done with all of your world travels and experiences. Um, we've, we, I was, I'm quite surprised here. You haven't gone skiing. Um, I, uh, yes, we got, we got good snowfall up here in the Cascades, uh, outside of Seattle, Washington, which is where I live. Took my boys, uh, on new year's Eve and it was almost, uh, empty, which surprised me because we had snowfall the entire time and we had great skiing and, uh, and short lift lines so about all you can ask for. Um, but my name is Dan Freckling. Thanks Sean very much for, uh, for allowing me to be on your podcast. I'm CEO of Boltive. Um, and, uh, I've had a little bit of my, my own kind of journey about how I ended up here, which, which we can talk about in a moment. But uh, for, for the areas that Bolta protects against, the um, malware and advertising and other media is a problem. Offensive and annoying, uh, annoying ads and interruptions are part of that. But the big driver right now, especially this year and especially uh, right now as we record this, is a, a major movement in data privacy that's going on, not just in the U.S., but really around the world. And so uh, our, our software also protects against privacy violations that uh, uh, that through this protection, brands can keep their consumers safe. So what kinds of privacy issues do end users and brands face? There's really kind of a couple key areas. One is, is, is around um, advertising and the other is around on what's called on-page digital objects. And so let me kind of explain why, why each of those are important. So advertising, especially what's called programmatic targeted advertising really funds the open web that we've grown used to. That's why content is free and 80 to 90% of news is paid for by ads. Although we say we see paywalls from time to time, digital ads are over 70% of all ads um, in marketing. It's about a half a trillion spend globally. So that's, that's the one side of it. Now, digital objects, which may be a little bit harder to conceive of, those are like tags on pages, pixels, beacons, uh, they, they enable commerce on the web. And 95% of marketing websites use Google Analytics, which is a very well-known um, um, example of this. But there's other, other tags out there too. Um, Facebook has pixels that um, have gained some notoriety and, um, and there's many more. But these, these allow um, measurement of conversions to know if somebody saw an ad or took an action later, are those two connected? And, um, and that's a really the, the, two, the two key parts of it. But the problem is that both online advertising and on-page digital objects may sell and share data, which violates newly enacted consumer rights. Newly enacted, I say, in the U.S., because as we record this on January 2nd, two new laws just took effect yesterday. One is California um, uh, CPRA and the other is Virginia's VCDPA. And uh, that's a, quite a... a uh, use of acronyms, but they're basically two privacy laws that are protecting users from their data being um, being sold or shared. And it, it's a key issue because the amount of and, and scope and scale of, of trading of user data is beyond what most people realize. So it there's a, there's 250 billion um, real time auctions per day, and that compares to 15 billion stock trades per day. When those auctions are happening, user data is being sold to the highest bidder. And we can talk about what that kind of user data is, but it's you, it's me, it's where we've been, it, 
It can be sensitive data like health conditions, political beliefs, ethnicity, immigration status, sexual orientation. All of that is actually quite valuable in the world of advertising. So I'll stop there for a second to just kind of paint the picture of, of online ads and digital objects being the, the, the two enablers of, of, of the web, but also two key culprits also. I'd like you to go into these two new laws that were just passed. Um, you mentioned the names of them, but what do they actually do and how are they different from each other? And, and are they basically just clones of GDPR or not? GDPR started it all. Um, so that is true. And, and many, many laws around the world have sought to um, emulate GDPR, including what's going on in the U.S. But uh, California is really the leader in the U.S. California, what you'll find is we'll talk about California, Virginia, but there's actually three um, other states uh, that are um, that are passing laws as well uh, later this year. But California and Virginia are the real trendsetters around this, and uh, and California in particular. California passed the CCPA um, in 2018 through um, our legislative process, and I think it took effect in 2020, and then it wasn't strong enough, so they passed an amendment called CPRA, which was through the referendum, which meant it was it was uh, initiated by the voters or initiated by uh, interest groups and, and voted in by the voters, not the legislature. Um, and so the, 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 the protections in California have just become greater and greater to protect um, their citizens. Virginia is a little bit more business friendly. Um, it, it has some elements that are not quite as strong um, as what's stated in um, California. For example, in California, when, uh, when we talk about the definition of a sale of user data, it's for anything of value, not just monetary value. In Virginia, the definition is really around monetary value. So that's one area that makes California stronger. But on the other hand, Virginia is quite strong too, because it has this concept of sensitive data. And sensitive data under Virginia law, you must opt into. You must, you must affirmatively say, yes, I will share my data. Whereas in California, it's an opt out regime, meaning if you don't say anything, the assumption is you're allowing your data to be shared. You need to opt out. Well, the opt in for sensitive data in Virginia is much more like GDPR. And so Virginia is one of three states that has this opt in regimen. So as strong as California is and as pervasive as it is and as trend setting as it is, it's not quite as strong as Virginia in that regard. But both laws are taking effect um, along with uh, in uh, it, it, later this year, there's also um, uh, Connecticut, um, Utah law is going into effect. Colorado is going into effect. And every single one of these laws has certain protections that involve targeted advertising, since that has been the standard bearer of, of consumer awareness and um, outrage, and, and I, I would say around privacy violations. How can companies become compliant for these new laws? Would it be sufficient to just say we're GDPR compliant and, and that's good enough? Or is there differences in, in actual compliance for the U.S.? There is some merit to that. If you if you plan and you orient around the most stringent laws in the world, if you're say you're a global business, then you're not wrong. It's much better, in my opinion, to do that than to try to geofence your users and try to do the Virginia thing for Virginia residents and the Colorado thing for Colorado residents and the California thing for California residents because uh, IP identification is not infallible. So yes, if you're a global business, many already have managed to the stringent elements of GDPR and then set that as their global standard. Um, there, but there's other things I would say companies should do beyond that because it really starts with assigning a leader for your data privacy program. And it doesn't need to be as formalized as the G data protection officers that are required under GDPR. Um, you can, if you're just operating in the US, for example, just, just assign someone um, who's, who's point on that. The, the second thing though, is really understanding where your data is going and mapping your data across the organization because many businesses just don't know. They don't know where their own data is kept. They don't have all their databases in, in alignment, and they don't know what their vendors are doing with the data either. So knowing where your pockets of data are and inventorying that, and there's there's good frameworks around like the NIST, um, NIST uh, privacy framework. But this, this idea of knowing where your data is means an inventory of, of attention to where the data is stored, especially if it's sensitive data. And then the data flow. 
how is it transmitting? How is it? What's the full life cycle of when it starts and when it's used and when you purge it? There was a, not too long ago that there were append only databases where na- data was never thrown away. Um, well, that's that's a real risk because businesses have gotten caught with data that's five or 10 years old that violates laws. And that's data that they weren't really using anyway, which is kind of a tragedy to get uh, suffer fines for data that you weren't really using. But anyway, th- those are, I would say, assigning someone um, to be a point person, mapping out where your data is going. And then there's more sophisticated things that Boltiv can do to make sure that you're not um, inadvertently um, making mistakes in, in, uh, in how your consumer data is, is then being um, really is being leaked. So how can companies figure out how to map their data then? If you pick one of these frameworks, like NIST is a good one, if you pay attention to what's called PII, personally identifiable information or sensitive data, and again, sensitive data would be health, race, religion, religion, politics, union membership, immigration status, you, um, and you recognize that your, your data sprawl is likely, even if you're a small business, just track which databases you're using, um, what APIs you may have set up or data flows or da- data transfers to external partners. And why this is so important is because there's the right in, in California um, for access and delete, meaning contact a business and require that business to tell, that, to tell you all the data that they have on you and then delete it if you request and, and, and correct it also. This is a very hard thing to do, to access, delete, and correct if you don't know where the data is. So that, I think, is really, really key. Around data flow, where it's moving between systems and this full life cycle concept, what are the rules you want to set for the people who own that data and operate that data? And what third parties are, do, you want to, um, do, you, do you want to honor as well? So I think that's that's a good place to start. There are um, consultants out there that can help you um, get started with that. And there's software like Boltivs that helps automate the process. But it, that's where I would say the next steps would be. How are you able to discover the malware and these other issues that these brands are facing and their end users are, are dealing with? We have two technologies, which are scanning and blocking. And the scanning that we do is, which is protected by several patents, is, is to undertake user journeys. So we visit websites, we uh, simulate real users, and we do this in partnership with these websites. So if we're working with a travel company, we might be business travelers. If we're working with an athletic company, we might be college athletes. If we're working with a consumer goods company, we might emulate young parents. And you can do this emulating the patterns, the browsing history, the purchase history of these different personas. And we scan, meaning we, we go through the customer journey, we visit websites, we, we click on things, we, we browse uh, things, we, we consume ads, and we record everything that's going on to see if anything contains malware, um, contains Trojans, contains redirects, um, malicious browser extensions, if, if those are resident in the ads. And then that's, that's the scanning part. But then we supplement that with blocking, which is uh, everything I've described to you so far requires no integration, but the, um, the blocking portion is, is a line of code that then sits on websites. And then when one of these signatures comes up, one of these problems comes up, we can block it and replace that with a good ad and make sure that the user experience and the revenue um, and the marketing reach aren't interrupted. What made you want to get into this? The way I got into this was actually accidental. So um, I was my own victim, I guess, of predatory advertising. And my wife one day had back pain. And when she was experiencing that back pain, we went on a lot of health sites. So we searched for different causes. We searched for physical therapy that, we, that she could do. And then after no improvement, after a while of this, we went in for an MRI and we got a very surprising diagnosis, which was possible cancer. More tests, we got the worst news, which was it, what's called non-small cell lung cancer, which is a non-smoker's form of lung cancer. And it was stage four, so it had spread throughout her body. So then I went into overload, really, uh, overdrive. And I was um, looking all over the web for information on this. What are the different treatments? What's the prognosis? What, what can you do? And I didn't realize 
that I was being profiled based on my browse history and the sites that I was going to. So I started to get these ads for shady cancer treatments. And, and some of them, you know, were very suspicious, um, but they were all personal. And this is what, where I discovered data leakage and surveillance advertising that you can be observed where you're going and you can be targeted based on that. And after a career as a marketer for most of my career, prior to that point, I realized how intrusive and predatory, um, this marketing can be. And these ads are so durable that even after my wife passed away, I was still seeing the ads about cancer treatments. So that's a real problem. At the same time, I was finishing up, um, I was integrating a business that I had just sold to Verisk, my, my prior business, which was in cybersecurity also. And uh, I was ready to try something different. And I came across Voltiv uh, through, um, through an introduction. And I realized that they had the technology to stop this kind of intrusive ac um, media. And by taking it from the malware world, which I described a moment ago, and applying it to the privacy world, so there's this sort of kinship between security and privacy, and we're seeing that overlap growing. We were able to do something that no one's done before, which is actually create a smoke test for internet pipes to see where the data leaks are, who exactly is causing them, which of your vendors, how to stop them, and then to correct and then to verify that the, that the corrections have been made. So from kind of a, a personal situation, um, I found myself taking a left turn career-wise and uh, joining Bolt of the CEO the pervasiveness of getting ads you don't want is crazy and it's it's possible that you were still getting ads because even after she died you were the one who had been doing the searches so maybe it was assuming you were the one who had the cancer and as long as you were searching you were still alive therefore you might still have cancer and might still want these things i might have also gotten bucketed in uh into a medical care professional because the, the amount of research I was doing was suggestive of someone who might be a doctor and the ads for doctors are very premium priced. So there's an incentive to serve those ads to medical professionals. There's all kinds of reasons and all this stuff that's underpinning the, the ecosystem of advertising um, that led these ads to be, as I said, so durable and pervasive that I couldn't get rid of them. I've heard of examples where like a guy got something in the mail from Walmart, like for a, a baby crib or something for his daughter, like, you know, something about pregnancy. And the daughter like, wasn't even sure she was pregnant yet, but she had been doing some research about pregnancy. And the dad was like, what's going on? Well, it turned out she was pregnant. And it was obviously they were pissed because, you know, Walmart was breaching her privacy because I think she was a minor. Um, but I, I've, I've also encountered this where like, oh, you know, I want to go to Italy. And then next thing you know, I tell someone on WhatsApp, I want to go to Italy. And, you know, 20 minutes later, I'm on Google and I'm getting served ads to get flights to Italy. It's un uncanny how that happens. I, I think the story you're describing, I believe it was Target. But the, the, but the, the, the details you're describing are, under, I understand what happened, that she hadn't told her parents. She was searching for things that made Target's algorithm think that, she was pregnant and then she started getting coupons and, and baby related stuff and that outed her in a sense. Uh, and that was just the beginning. So there is a bit of a stir that's still going on now. After Roe versus Wade was overturned in the US, there was the, the Dobbs decision, which um, allowed states to basically set their own rules on, um, on uh, pro-life versus pro-abortion stances. But, but one of the areas that makes the internet kind of our friend and our foe is that geolocation allows businesses to see the advertisers really uh, internet media to see if someone is near or inside um, uh, planned parenthood um, or uh, family planning centers or where places where abortions are offered and if you overlay that with the law enforcement element, which is that it is it is legal for law enforcement to purchase private data that's collected this way through geolocation, through search history. And law enforcement can purchase that information and use it in prosecution without running afoul of the Fourth Amendment to unreasonable search and seizure. There's a real concern that 
the combination of knowing someone is searching for family planning help, that they have been inside or near um, an abortion clinic could lead to prosecution, could lead to evidence that could get people arrested. Um, so that's where the kind of elements of privacy and safety and, and law enforcement intersect. And it goes far beyond the target case where it's fairly innocuous, kept within the family. Now you've got the potential for crimes to be um, accused, people to be accused of crimes based on internet information that otherwise wouldn't have been available through law enforcement surveillance practices. I mean, that's what Minority Report was warning against, was precognitive crime or pre, pre, yeah. pre-committed crimes and having those people be, be arrested for committing a crime, for, for you know thinking about committing a crime or planning on committing a crime. Showing all the pre-planning, all the premeditation, but not, right, but not committing the act. And I'm sure the things that you contend with are, are you know, in that realm. They're, you know, preventing people from having the government be uh, too, too hot to, to trot, too hot to handle. That is true. And beyond that, even, I, we're seeing in, in the past year that uh, privacy has also become a national security issue as well. So um, Google in, in mid-2021, there was a group of senators that sent a letter in the ad tech ecosystem saying that, da- that data shared in digital ads would be a gold mine for foreign intelligence. And then a year later, Google was found to be sharing data with RuTarget, which is actually a sanctioned Russian company, a unit of spare bank that was subject to sanctions after the invasion of Ukraine. And uh, that was exactly what the senators had warned against. Then in September of of 2022, a few months ago, Biden uh, signed an executive order um, assessing foreign firms' use of data for um, surveillance, tracing, and tracking. So that was Google. Now, a little bit closer to the conversation is TikTok. And TikTok was investigated mid last year because they misled lawmakers about Chinese employees' access to US data. Also mid last year, there was a $92 million class action against TikTok that a judge approved. And as more and more um, evidence kind of came around this in December, I guess just a few days ago, just last month, there was a ban for federal government employees on government dev- devices can no longer use TikTok. That was following a ban in the House, 13 states, college campuses. And why Why is everybody going after TikTok? What's the problem? Are we just, are we being China-phobic? Well, um, China's national intelligence law requires citizens to assist in state intelligence work. And every company has a chapter of the Chinese Communist Party. So you can't really, as a private industry, um, get away from a a request from the Chinese authorities. So TikTok has become quite a magnet, but it's not just TikTok, as I mentioned, it's Google. And then the most recent, I think, we talk about the, the, the dangers of unfriendly countries, a Russian software vendor called Pushwush was found to be installed in military and U.S. government agencies because they had uh, they had disguised themselves. I think they they had purported to have American employees based in Washington D.C. and this SDK, which was installed to uh, profile online activity of app users, was uh, was actually run out of a company out of Siberia. And similarly to the Chinese law, Russian authorities have compelled local companies to hand over user data too. So we're seeing this overlap and we're seeing the privacy issues become um, criminal uh, related, as we talked about a moment ago with the Dobbs decision and national security related with the actual um, involvement of technology companies with with Google and TikTok and Pushwush being three commercial examples of that. Yeah, TikTok's a really bad one. It's it's been made clear that they have two algorithms, one for inside of China and one for outside of China. The one inside of China promotes social harmony, positive things, because the Chinese government wants people to see positive imagery and things that promote them being good citizens. But what they promote outside of China are things that aren't positive, things that get people angry, the things that they know work in the Facebook algorithm um, things that 
that don't create social harmony. They, they want to create stress and anxiety and panic and fear in citizens around the world as long as they're not Chinese citizens. Right. It's, the algorithm's good for eyeballs. And cl- it started with sound bites, then clickbait, and now scrolling, right? You can't get away. It's much harder to turn away from the TikTok app if you're engaged in a, in a, in a mood of anxiety. I deleted TikTok a while ago. I just, yeah, I'm, I'm not a social media person. So I've got an Instagram, but like I post pictures of my dog once every few months when I'm with him. You know, I've got a Twitter, but like I share podcast quotes like, uh, you know, I I don't use social media. So I'm able to see what's happening without being exposed to it directly. Although there isn't so much in the social media space where, well, I guess there are still invasive ads and all that, but. I don't suspect a social media company is going to come knocking on your door and go, hey, help us to protect our users because they probably don't care. First of all, what you just described there is best practice for privacy protection is to not overshare information. Um, you know, we don't think about this, but your, your dog is safe, but people will share pictures and photos and activities of their children. And there's a, that creates a permanent record. And is harm going to come from that? Hard to really know, but that child's going to grow up to be an adult and that permanent record will still be out there. So the o- oversharing problem, I think in social media's encouraging of that does run counter to privacy. Um, but that, so what, what you're describing there is a good practice. And I, yeah, and I, I don't think social media networks really care about privacy because it, 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 it also uh, cuts across their desire to monetize their users because their services are free after all. But there, there's a bunch of things user, there's a bunch of things individuals can do to protect themselves and, um, not oversharing is one of them. Uh, managing your privacy settings. You know, we we are about to, um, you know, as as we record this in early January, we're we're not too far away from the uh, National Data Privacy Week that runs January twenty fourth to January twenty eighth, and that's a good time to remember to rethink your digital footprint and to to rethink your your digital footsteps. Uh, there's a a resource from the National Cybersecurity Center, which is which created um, Data Privacy Week. And this is staysafeonline.org. And we can maybe put this in the show notes. But if you go to stay safe, staysafeonline.org, there is uh, a bunch of links so that you can manage your privacy settings. You can go to major apps like Amazon, uh, websites like Amazon and apps like Venmo, Zoom, Spotify. And through this utility, you can opt out and you can update your privacy settings to be safe. So that's um, that's one thing to consider. Other things like you, you deleted TikTok, good move. We, a lot of us have apps that are sitting on our mobile devices that may be tracking us. iOS is a little bit better about that, but delete unused apps, don't keep them around. When you use a browser, be aware, maybe you wanna use a privacy safe browser like Brave or Ghostery Dawn or Firefox. And like apps, you might want to delete unused browser extensions. When you do your searching, do you want to use Google where you're going to be tracked and recorded? Or do you want to use something like DuckDuckGo where, again, you don't leave a history of what everything you're doing? Um, so there's lots of things that we can do as we think about our privacy. And it, it, it's really a continuum, right? We like we love convenience and we love privacy, but we there there are trade offs to be made. And some of us that don't care about privacy and care more about convenience will do certain things, and some that swing in the other direction on that gradient um, will will opt more for privacy. The problem that I have with those people are, is, oh, I I've got nothing to worry about. I'm not doing anything wrong. And my my counter argument is, it doesn't matter if you're doing nothing wrong. The fact remains is what you do should be private. No one should have the ability to see that. And and that's that. That's right. And yeah, am, I, am I doing anything wrong? No, I, I mean, no, people don't, for the large part, do things wrong, but there are things that are private about them that they may not realize, like th- their health conditions. My, with our family, it was cancer. But there's all kinds of other health conditions that could be embarrassing that you don't want necessarily dozens and dozens of uh, ecosystem partners and ad tech to know that uh, are, can be shared and can be accessed. So is there anything we haven't talked about that you'd like to add? If we think about where marketing is going and where the world is going, I guess, that there's been this, this movement 
Um, I think if we, we take a little bit of history, I think there's a nice history lesson here because privacy was a non-event really until about 15 years ago. No one really talked about privacy. And the origin of tracking on the web came about because of changes in media and with the rise of the internet and more importantly, with the rise of search engines, you got this starting point for web surfers where people weren't using the web like they used to use magazines. Like the dawn of the internet, you were going to MSN, you're going to AOL, you're going to Yahoo, and that's the destination. That's where all your content was. So if you're buying a car, you're going to go to Yahoo, you're going to go to MSN, you're going to go to AOL, and you're going to research. But then when search engines came around, the audience fragmented, and you've got all these different places where you can visit sites and learn about cars. And that's where cookies came along. Right. We didn't we haven't spent a lot of time talking about cookies here, but the the first unique cookie was was invented in 94 by Netscape by a young engineer who was simply trying to allow a browser to remember um, private privately and anonymously remember a user that had signed in or had something in their shopping cart or preferred a certain language. And then the cookie became a monster because a year later, DoubleClick said, hey, this this utility that was created by Netscape, you know what? We can use that to follow people around the internet because DoubleClick was in so many different places and seeing users in multiple sites. And that is what's led to all these targeting innovations over 20 years, with what's called interest-based uh, interest advertising that tracked users across sites, the multi-device era in 2007 with, uh, with the iPhone that created cross-app advertising. And then seven years later, you had these device graphs which Facebook is really, really good at. And you can connect someone between their mobile device, desktop, and later connected TV. So that was the kind of snowballing effect of all the targeting and retargeting, using data collected in one place to serve an ad to somebody in another place. And at the same time, when you had um, data breaches growing at a really high rates, which I think the data breach grew from 419 cases in the U.S. and uh, about 10 years ago to, to almost 1,900 um, most recent year. You had Edward Snowden, you had Equifax, you had Cambridge Analytica. You had this great collision in 2018 that actually led us to GDPR, and that collision was between hyper targeting and data protection. Well, that's where we find ourselves today. Even though we're less than five years later, we're kind of in this aftermath of how uh, of this collision and why uh, privacy is moving in the direction it is. So I, I think that's something to think about as we observe uh, Data Privacy Week, which is again the twenty fourth to the twenty eighth of January. But also remember that data privacy isn't just a week. Uh, there's data being shared probably in ways we don't realize. 51 other weeks of the year besides uh, Data Privacy Week. So, so to kind of create our own awareness of that and to make our own choices about how much we want to share because uh, that the world is changing and the laws are there to protect consumers from, uh, from some of the dangers. And one of the things I, I've mentioned in a previous episode, I think it was, it was 102, um, I was talking with a cybersecurity expert from uh, Portugal and what I had said in that episode, which I'll say again here, is you may think that your encrypted conversations today will forever remain encrypted, but quantum computing will destroy those encryption methods, which means anything you say at any time to anyone on any application can at any point in the future potentially become public. So it doesn't matter if you are just looking for privacy you know, in the browser, if you're not thinking about privacy when it comes to what you say on a device, you need to be doing that as well. That's a great point. I didn't, I didn't know that. I guess you're right. Quantum computing can break encryption. Then nothing is safe. I do remember that episode. I think it was with Dr. Eduardo Rocha. That was a really good one. Um, I enjoyed listening. Data privacy is extremely complicated. Conversations are very complicated. Basically the best way to live your life is if you don't want anyone to know what you're thinking or saying, then don't think it or say it in a way that other people can access. Fortunately, our thoughts will still be our own, uh, pr will be protected by our skulls, but anything else that leaves our bodies is now, as, as you suggest, subject to inspection. <laughs> Not after Neuralink. 
Oh, there's, a, there's another episode topic, Neuralink. Once you get a Neuralink, your thoughts are no longer yours. And the next step after that is piping ads right into your brain. All right. Well, then my New Year's resolution is to not Neuralink with anybody anywhere knowingly. <laughs> That's a good one. It's like Bluetooth for your brain. Yeah. Okay. It sounds, it sounds good. It sounds good until you think about it. Uh, how can people follow up? I really enjoyed uh, speaking with you about this, Sean. Great way to reach me. Uh, my email is dan at boltive.com, B-O-L-T-I-V-E. You can also check out our website. Um, I'm on LinkedIn and I post about Privacy Matters, uh, Dan Freckling, uh, if you want to uh, connect there also. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I love talk, talking about this stuff, as you can tell. Um, it's fun um, and it's, it's timely. So again, I appreciate the, getting a chance to discuss this with you, Sean. Of course, I always am looking for interesting things to talk about. So if you know anyone that would make a great guest, definitely let me know that that's for you or for anyone that's listening. I'm always looking for new guests. Uh, don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day and take care of your devices because if you don't, then you will have a tremendous amount of information being leaked to people you don't know making all sorts of money off of that information and and that's not a good thing so uh, make sure you are aware of that as we head into the the rest of this year so thank you again dan and look forward to our next episode 129 thank you